Good morning. Uh, it's a real, real pleasure to be here today um, for several reasons. Firstly, they don't let me out anymore very much. Uh, secondly, we've got health questions in the house this morning, and forgive me, I can't stay as long as I would like. Um, but mainly, it's a pleasure to be at the Royal College. Um, I was reflecting just a moment ago um, that I've been in the industry 15 years. Um, I was never a proper research scientist. I was reflecting what my A-level biology would teacher would say if he saw me now speaking at the Royal College. But mainly it's a pleasure to be here to welcome um, this piece of work and the wider work that the college and CASME uh, and the people in this room are doing on data and on the 21st century life sciences landscape. I wanted just to say something about uh, how I think that landscape is changing and how dramatically it's changing and particularly the power of genomics and uh, data, big data and informatics in transforming what I describe as a, a new 21st century landscape for biomedicine. And just flag one or two of the key policy uh, implications which we're trying to deal with in government, uh, particularly through the early access and the adaptive licensing scheme, and to touch on one or two of the uh, political, small p, non-party, but political challenges that I and we face in carrying the public and patients with us. Um, I should just start by saying, uh, as the UK's first Minister for Life Sciences, my main objective is to make sure that I'm not the last. Uh, and it's a serious point, and it goes to um, Sir Richard, your introductory remarks. I, I don't consider myself a Minister for Pharmaceuticals, and the Prime Minister didn't appoint me as the Minister for Pharmaceuticals. He's appointed me to lead something that is absolutely central to Britain's recovery in the 21st century, recovery from the debt crisis at the end of the 20th, and recovery as an ageing society. You touched on, Sir Richard, the challenge of an ageing society. This is the mission, uh, to bring science and innovation right to the heart of our health system for really two strategic aims. Firstly, to make sure that we spend every health pound in our advanced health care economy smartly. We get more health from every pound. And we all know in this room that precision medicine, uh, earlier diagnosis, the use of data, the use of genomics, is going to allow us to stop doing 20th century medicine, which in many ways has been quite blind. Uh, we give the same drugs to the same people without measuring uh, often whether they take them, let alone measuring actually in detail the side effects in patients with multiple comorbidities. Uh, we have a health economic system which we've led the world in the 20th century in the averaging out of health benefits. Um, in the 21st, precision medicine is going to require us and drive us uh, to embrace something very exciting, which is being able to much earlier detect which patients are likely to get, uh, which diseases to respond to, which drugs in which way, and start to develop much more precise and earlier and, in due course, preventative interventions and much more stratified and potentially personalised uh, therapies. A and this essentially, the major shift, I think, that this requires is the end of that old model in the 20th century where uh, deep biology was done in university labs and then if you were lucky in the late 20th century, spun out into companies financed, acquired by Big Pharma, and through 10, 12, 13 years, one and a half billion dollars, comes back to the NHS as a late purchaser of a very expensive drug. What we somehow need to do is to focus in on the clinical assets. We need to shift the center of gravity so that we are designing drugs and devices and diagnostics with and around the patients. And not least, I mean, not just because of the importance of understanding the genomic and the clinical um, uh, predispositions to both disease and to response to, to drugs, but because ultimately it's the patients who pay for this. It's the patients who are suffering the disease. It's the health system has to track and deal with the life cycle of uh, the patient pathway. And one of the major opportunities for us to spend every health pound more smartly and indeed to create a healthcare innovation economy is to be able to track and measure much better the inefficiencies in the current model of delivery. We all know they are there. Um, we still spend uh, too much money treating the late stage symptoms of uh, too late diagnosed disease rather than intervening earlier. And certainly my constituents, uh, their pathway tends to be a mixed journey from primary care to hospital to social care with an aging society. Unless we have a proper system for measuring and mapping and, uh, and, and tracking the health interventions, the health and care interventions, which are driving those chronic disease costs that, that threaten to make 21st century healthcare less and less affordable, then we won't be able to actually have a basis for measuring innovations. So the first thing is life science, science of life, science and technology in the healthcare system 
to drive smarter precision medicine for the 21st century and to do that adoption in a way that creates new markets, new opportunities for investment in the UK to create the wealth, to your point, that we'll need to pay for this modern healthcare. So that my mission uh, and the Prime Minister's mission, and this goes very much to the top of his personal agenda, is to make Britain, again, the best place in the 21st century to come and do innovative medicines and medical technology design and development. And we think the key to that uh, is to make sure that the NHS is an active participant in the research process. So in the Prime Minister's speech in 2011, which I'd commend you to have a look at if you haven't, he set out a very powerful vision. Every hospital, a research hospital, every NHS, every willing NHS patient, a research patient, to try and get back to that a founding vision of the NHS as a public health vehicle to drive its privileged expertise uh, and position in public health for public benefit. Um, I wanted to say something about why early access and adaptive licensing uh, are really key to this. If we're going to take time and money, which are the great drivers of medical innovation, out of the system, we've got to make it easier for people to come to Britain, uh, work with our leading clinical research centres, work with our patients and our hospitals, develop, uh, design, and then test and prove innovations, and then go much more quickly through into earlier use in patients for several reasons. Firstly, patients deserve us to do everything we can to get the innovations to them more quickly. But early access to, for patients to innovation is the flip side of early access for the developers of innovation to patients and to clinical assets. So I think that the early access to medicine scheme and the adaptive licensing scheme are two really important initiatives uh, in this agenda. I won't talk through them in detail other than to say this. Our vision is that the early access uh, scheme starts right back in research. We want people to come to Britain, land on the NIHR runway, we spend a billion a year in the NHS research platform, go through with um, an NIHR clinical infrastructure support to identify the innovation and then with NICE and the MHRA holding your hand at the beginning uh, rather than waiting at the end, helping you guide a data package to go through into early access. In, very, uh, in the early access scheme, it'll be rare and untreated or ill-treated diseases where patients haven't got any alternative. And if the data supports um, uh, efficacy and impact, then to go through, uh, through into specialist commissioning, albeit in very small patient cohorts. But we want that scheme to drive a much earlier integration of evidence-based uh, evaluation through commissioning and data uh, absolutely central to it. And then the adaptive licensing scheme is about exploiting the flexibilities that are built rightly into the European framework so that Britain becomes the best place to come and access that uh, European licensing framework with innovative medicines, initially in a small target group of patients with the ability to expand out uh, later on the back of, again, data. Um, the early access uh, scheme launched in uh, the spring of this year. Um, we still got a lot of work to do to link it through into specialist commissioning and I can tell you that active work is going on at the moment to make sure that it works in the way that I've described. We had our first promising medicines uh, approval as a second in the pipeline. We want there to be more like uh, 10 or 15 a year rather than uh, one or two but we're in the early stages of launching it. And the early access uh, scheme again launched this spring uh, and uh, sorry the, the adaptive licensing scheme launched uh, this spring. I, I, Latest data, we've got 26 uh, applications in, and the EMA have selected three. Uh, but I think as well as these two schemes, we need to be telling a coherent story about how you access this British landscape. It is a world-class landscape. I'm just back from a four-city, five-time zone, 40-meeting whistle-stop tour of the US to tell the story of what we're doing here in the UK. And I can tell you, we can't tell it often enough, because when people understand the power of our landscape, the clinical excellence, the NIHR, the NHS research, landscape and what we're doing on supply side reforms to help the life science sector and the regulatory reforms, uh, then I, the, the, the penny is really starting to drop. And I have to say it was a pleasure um, as an ambassador for the UK to hear the FDA being beaten up by American companies and researchers uh, for starting to lose ground and lose pace on having an enlightened regulatory and procurement regime. But actually the MHRA and NICE lead in the world in this. Uh, and our vision is to make sure that in the 21st century we have a much quicker runway to come through to patients. I want to just to close uh, with this. Something is going right. In 2013, we pulled in £483 million into the uh, uh, UK life science sector here, here in the UK. In the first half of this year, we pulled in £740 
30 million. We're on track for 1.4 billion this year. Something is happening in the UK and in the life science sector again. This focus on patient-centered early access into clinical uh, infrastructure is having a really catalytic effect. I close just with this. Um, the, one of the purposes for having a minister who's accountable to Parliament, as I will be later this morning, is to remind me and us that unless we carry patients and the public with us, we will uh, get left behind and we will find the things we know we need to do, we can't do. Uh, and I really worry on data that the message needs to be much more empowering, it needs to be much more about its patients' data that the NHS and government has a vital stewardship role for you on. Uh, and we should be telling people the exciting story of 21st century medicine, access to your electronic records, your ability to plug into research. As soon as anyone or a loved one has a diagnosis, they get very, very, very interested in research and in what's available and in access. Uh, and I think we need to tell a story of this is your data. We merely look after it for you. We have a duty on your behalf to look at the anonymized data to make sure that we're tracking and we're, we're transparent about best and worst practice uh, and, and we're looking after public uh, and patient safety. But we also want patients to be able to access the data, to opt out if they really want to, but I think if we explain the benefits, few will want to, <clears throat> but crucially to opt in to an exciting new world with their charities of driving research <clears throat> and sharing data. Um, I shall stop there and look forward to any questions. Thank you very much.